part. Uh, we thank you very much, uh, very much for that. Also, you're most welcome. So, uh, yeah, I would say without uh, further ado, I will leave the word to you. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>
to have enough information about the architecture of such a system. Um, in, the, in the context of a building architecture, um, we don't know anything about the used technology. So how's electricity? Does, a, does this building have um, ethernet built in or fiber cables built in? Um, how's the heating made ele electrical systems, whatever? Technology is completely missing. Internal structure is missing. We don't know much about the interfaces to the external world. So probably we can see some windows. Yes, a window is some kind of interface, but usually interfaces are not visible. How's the water pumped into the building? How's the water pumped out of the building? And so on. From the image, we don't get any information about any reason of a decision. So why did the architect construct the building in an arc shape? Um, they will surely have had their reasons, but the reasons cannot be deduced just from looking at the picture. That's an observation I share from the building architecture to the software architecture, because in software architectures, I often see one diagram and people say, oh, that's my architecture. And from my personal viewpoint, um, that's not enough. So um, architecture, and then we can come over to software. Um, architecture is way more than a single diagram. Um, no, even if we compress the diagram and put a lot of information in the diagram, that's rarely or never ever enough. Um, other people say, oh, the truth is embodied in the source code of the system, uh, be it Java or C Sharp or .NET, whatever. Mm, I'm not sure. Um, no, I am very sure the whole truth is not contained in the source code. Um, I'm sure all of you can imagine situations where you need an explanation for something. So you need to know the reason why things have been made the way they are made. And source code is a very bad location to give reasons for certain decisions, for technology decisions or whatever. So in practice, in reality, we need more than source code and we need more than a diagram. That's how we, how we came up with the idea of having some more um, in architecture. Now, let's step back a bit. What's the situation in practice? Or at least, what was my situation in practice over the last couple of years? Um, one thing I encountered in reality, in real life, real world organizations, is a kind of shipwreck. So we found some documentation that might have been correct, and current many, many years ago. But by now, it's completely rotten. So it's, it's not correct anymore. It's just wasting space. And um, like this shipwreck in the desert, it's of no use. It probably is interesting for researchers in archeology span or researchers in shipwrecks, but definitely not for developers who want to continue maintaining a system. That was one situation I really disliked. The other one I encountered and I also disliked, I found that in German government organizations, like the finance, uh, the Ministry of Finance I worked for a few years. They over-documented everything. So they have tons of documentation nobody knows which parts of that huge pile is still current so it's still useful and which pile have with which parts have only been constructed to fulfill some standards whatever so you're lost similar to the desert but it's more than a single shipwreck it's dozens or literally hundreds of shipwrecks um, in, in case anybody of you has ever encountered the issue of network drives, you probably have seen that. 
in companies. There is a network share and everybody's dumping documents and on this network share, which gets fuller and fuller. And the admins add hard drives, so to have more space. Um, but the real value of the network drives diminishes because nobody finds anything. Uh, no good idea. So the next thing I encountered in practice is overly huge diagrams. Um, I just copied this example from the internet. So this is not from one of my projects. In one project I, I worked with or I, I participated in, we had a document, a, a diagram printout, a printout. Probably currently you have huge monitors and say, oh, nobody needs to print a document. By the time I worked in that project, they printed the diagram and hold tight to something. The printout was six meters, six meters long. How can a printer print such a diagram? Yes, there are companies that can print six meter diagrams. The height was about two meters. They have attached, they, they had attached that diagram to the wall of a very big room. And people used to, to follow the lines on the six meter diagram to see what thing is connected to what other thing. That was completely ridiculous because people met in the center and, and one had to step back and lost his line and had to start over again. Really crazy. This is not what we need in reality. This is probably useful to impress people. Oh, this is things we built, it's so huge. No, impressing people is not what we want. We want practical support in day-to-day -day development of software. Such diagrams are not useful. I like diagrams, but they should be neat and tidy and small. Then they have real value. They might have a real value. So architecture cannot be only huge diagrams. That's no good. Um, about 15 years ago, I met with my good friend Peter Rushka and we compared experiences from our development projects. And we compared that shipwrecks and overly huge documentation, whatever. We came up with the idea of improving that situation by creating some kind of repository for architecturally relevant, inf relevant information. Not everything that can be said about a system, but the relevant information. So relevance, prioritized relevance was always um, a topic for us. Um, it, the first version of Arc42 was created from real world systems. So we, we took the systems we had, we knew them because we worked on the systems and we recreated architecture documentation for that systems in, in brief, small, um, small ways to optimize the structure. Um, Arc42 nowadays contains 12 parts. That's much, but not too much. Um, uh, and the, the basic fundamental idea is having a fixed structure and such fixed structures for interesting things is a very common, very, very commonly used pattern at everybody's home. You will all have a thing like you see here on the image. Probably you have drawers, probably you have doors to open, but you have a fixed structure on the inside and within your family, let's call your family the development team for a while, with your family you have some agreement what things to put in what place of this cupboard. For example, you have a fixed place in Arc42 for software requirements, for quality requirements, for example, for architecture decisions for code structure and so on. So many different interesting things for architecture have their fixed place, their fixed spots in Arc42. Um, it looks like that. I won't go over the details right now. I will show you the details a bit later on by giving you a practical, more or less practical example. Um, but um, 
Hack42 itself is documented quite extensively and for all these parts um, you find lots of information, what's contained in it, why it is useful, um, how is it connected with other parts of the template and so on. Um, let's try an overview. I personally like overviews of systems, so I'd like to give you an overview of how an ARC42 architecture documentation could look like. I know in this diagram you see here, I'll increase the size a little, um, you cannot read anything. That's deliberate. You don't need to read currently. Just look what kinds of information is present and please look at the top line. Um, this is a real world system that, that I helped to build and it's a 4,000 person day system. 4,000 developer days, that's 20 person years. From my personal point of view, that's a big, big system. It's a huge piece of software. For such a huge piece of software, we only needed these kind of 15 something pages of architecture documentation. And everybody was happy with this small amount of documentation. So one promise ARC42 gives you, you can write compact, concise, small documents or documentation. If you don't like to write documents, if you like wikis more than documents, then use a wiki. We come to tooling a bit later on. But this is really in relation to the size of the system. This documentation is really small. Um, some of you might think, oh, for data migration, data migration I do only once, I don't need the documentation. Ah, that's for the German Ministry of Finance and in Germany we have some more than a dozen different regions. They had to reuse the system for all the German regions, um, so for the German states, uh, Bundesländer. Um, so the system was reused over and over again, so they needed architecture documentation, but this amount was enough. So in this document given here, you can see a small number of images, diagrams. Um, on the top right, on the bottom center, you see some diagrams. You see some text and you see some headings. So the relation between diagrams and text, you have more text than diagrams. That's interesting because text is easier to write and edit than documents. Because you can edit text with every editor. For diagrams, you probably need something special. Now, let's move this aside. Let's look at another one. That again is a fairly large system, 2000 person days, so 10 developer years of effort. That's from the German health insurance. Um, we have this health insurance personal cards given to all the insured persons. And that's one of the system creating this health insurance card, some complicated insurance stuff behind it. Um, we don't need to care about the details. We want to look at the architecture documentation. In this um, example, you see a lot of tables. So it's not not so much text, but more tables, so tabular information. I like tables a lot because they have a very simple structure. They're easy to comprehend. They're quite easy to write with every text processor you can imagine. Um, they are embedded, um, embedded um, um, in ARC42 at various places. Again, you see some diagrams. The diagrams are small because this is A4 size paper. So the printout was A4 size paper and the diagrams fit on a single page. Remember, huge diagrams are not useful. Single page diagrams might be useful. Um, and you don't see a lot of text. Um, such a document, less than 50 pages, so I wrote this documentation in Word, in Microsoft Word. 
it's not, probably not fun to write a documentation in Microsoft Word, but even in fairly large systems, it's possible. And I, I, I'm still alive, so I survived writing documentation in Word. Um, I will detail a third example with you. I give you an overview here. Um, this overview is a set of slides. Um, this system is an open source system and if you like you can read the source code to compare the code to the documentation. I wrote most parts of the code and I'm a really bad programmer so the code is not nice, it's not optimized, it's probably not even clean but the system is working. Um, I created the system to have something I have all the rights on because the system I, I do for my clients I have no rights in so I'm usually under non-disclosure I mustn't talk about these systems that one I can show to everybody show it to you um, yeah. here you see only very very little text a few tables and a few diagrams and um, I would like to use this example to dive into several sections of ARC42 to just give you an overview how that thing might work. Now, it's, it's an open source system to check generated HTML. Um, if you, as developers, document something, the chances are high you're using any tool that can produce HTML output that can be viewed in any browser or smartphone or whatever. And, um, these tools that generate HTML, they do a, a good job in generating, but probably you as an author, you make some mistakes. You reference images that are not present anymore, you misspell some links or whatever, and this open source tool tries to support you um, in, in the sense that it checks um, the generated HTML. So the business goal of that system if you want to call it business, so the goal of the system is to support authors writing digital formats. Um, what does it mean? Um, in case you use Markdown, ASCII doc, Textile, whatever formats, you want the generated HTML to be checked and verified. This verification or this check is very simple. I want something like a JUnit unit test report for my generated HTML showing me what kind of mistakes I made so I can fix them as an author. It's very simple. You don't need to understand the details right now because I want to show how the system is constructed. Um, for such a simple system, it's a big, configurable, very flexible, extremely flexible link checker. Probably you wouldn't write any documentation at all. Uh, I did it to have an example of architecture documentation. Now, one thing I would like to include in architecture documentation is an overview of requirements. An overview, not all the requirements, an overview of very important requirements. In this example, it's a simple table naming a few requirements. They have IDs, so I can reference them in the upcoming sections wherever I want. They have a very small description and as you see here it's a table because tables are easy, are very simple to write, simple to edit and so on. Another thing I would really like to include in architecture documentation is quality requirements. We don't talk about requirements engineering here. I'm sure you know what quality requirements are performance, flexibility, security, correctness, reliability, whatever, whatever, whatever. There is a huge standard, ISO standard, naming all these different quality topics. And yeah, probably these quality requirements are very fundamental to your architecture. If you want to build a high security system, you will take other architecture decisions than if you want to build a high performance system. And therefore, you really need to know these qualities. Very good practice is to include the quality requirements 
in the architecture documentation. They provide very good reasons for decisions, especially technology decisions. So include quality requirements. These requirements so far are part one of ARC 42. Part two is constraints. So what are your constraints you have to comply to? Technologies enforced by your company. Is it a fixed price project? Is it outsourced? Is it nearshore, offshore? Do you have to use some standard software, commercial, commercial off the shelf, whatever? In my case, it's open source, no big constraints. I, I invented a constraint. It should be implemented on the Java platform, preferably in Groovy. Groovy is not as strict as Java is, and I really like Groovy. If you haven't programmed in Groovy, give it a try. It's really great. Now, the third part of ARC42 begins diving into the system. No, actually not into the system, but in the environment of the system. Third part of ARC42, the context shows the external interfaces. The data or events or control flow triggering the system, data flowing in and data flowing out. In our case, it's really simple. We have a user that triggers something. We have a build system, uh, something like Maven, Gradle, whatever, that uses our system. And we have external interfaces to the file system and the internet. That's very simple. In your case, it's way more complicated, but your system as a black box contained here in the, in the third part of ARC42, the context. The fourth part, the so-called solution strategy, begins to give interesting facts about the architecture. So what is the underlying technical or structural solution approach? Our solution approach was to use an HTML part, remember, we are caring about HTML stuff. And one approach would have been, I do all the HTML parsing myself, which is a really big problem. Um, I was lazy, so I used an existing open source HTML parser and made it the platform of the whole system. So this is a solution. You can do it in another way. There are other HTML processors around. Hmm. I choose a specific one, and this is my, yes, solution strategy. Base the whole system on that open source technology. Another strategy was to apply a template method pattern. If you know design patterns, you might recognize template pattern. I deliberately decided against the plugin pattern, which would be very straightforward for many of you, but I decided against it. In an architecture document, you have to explain your decisions, not all the other possible solutions, but your decision and why you did it. Here in the beginning, part four is a few pages in the document. Um, I, I start giving this information about yeah detailed construction, uh, um, uh, detailed ways of construction. And this template method pattern is one way of achieving the flexibility. That was one of the quality goals mentioned before. I didn't read all the goals, but solution strategy is quite often you name the fundamental technologies you use within your system and give some reasons why you do that. So part number five. Now we come to the structure of the source code which is only one part of architecture. Yes, you definitely need to explain the structure of code. In that case, the code is quite small. So we have some, some packaging structure with some dependencies. You see here in the image, there is a core and some others. Um, and mm, I like on the top level, uh, top level decomposition of my system to recognize business entities. In modern terms, probably you use something like domain-driven design. It would be bounded context. 
on the on the top level of the building block structure and if you want more details you can dive into these on a second level so what i did i go back one slide um, uh, and i increase the slides slide size once more um, you see here the core and what i do now is i jump into the core so we call that level two building block um, you here find some more details you see how the core in itself is structured um, i can explain all these boxes and lines on that level two uh, in arc 42 we usually use a table for that i skipped the table here but i think you can imagine um, and um, ah no I, I didn't skip the table i'm sorry um, this table contains some info on the elements of the diagram. This is very typical in ARC42. It should be typical in all architecture documents. An image, a diagram should be explained in text or a table. I like tables, I said before. Now, you can drill down even further if you like. You are not required to. Drilled as far down to a level of detail, you think appropriate for your system. In this case, it's way too detailed. Everybody, at least a bit fluent in Java or Groovy, can read the source code and will understand what's going on. So in real life, I would drill down to a level three for huge systems at a few places. Um, in an overview, what we did in the building block view, so part five of ARC42, we drilled down into the source code structures, starting from the whole system as a black box. So the whole system you see on the, on the, in the top of that tree-like structure here is a black, actually the box is green, but I know you, you know what a black box is. The overall system is a black box in the context, and then we drill down step by step. To a level of detail we like. My personal proposal for teams is drill down to level one only. So in domain-driven design terminology give me your context map. All the details only if somebody really requires the details in a diagram. So be very restrictive here in the building block view. Don't draw many diagrams. Give me just one top level overview we can explain the rest at other uh, sections in ARC42, if you like. The building block hierarchy is a statical structure. It explains the structure of your source code. It does not explain how the elements of that structure interact at runtime. I'm sure you all have seen sequence diagrams like that. In a sequence diagram, you show the interaction. You show how, how building blocks of the static structure interact at runtime. This is part six of ARC42. So we are halfway through. We have drawn three or four diagrams and we are halfway through the architecture. And in such a scenario, runtime scenario, I can explain how the system really detects image map errors or whatever. Whatever scenario I would like to explain, I can do that in the runtime view. I could even do end-to-end -end scenarios, starting from a user and end-user interaction, pushing a button on a UI in a system, doing magic things in our, in our core or wherever, and creating some data that's leaving the system um, through an external interface. That's runtime view. That's dynamic structure of the system. <sighs> so far, we did not talk about deployment, about infrastructure, about environments where our software is actually executed. Obviously, you have all some development environment, your notebook or your desktop PC where you develop the system, but very often that's not the infrastructure, the, the overall system is being run. 
So probably you are deploying to some cloud service, probably you are deploying to some data center, ah, you might have some testing stages, whatever, and information about these environments, about the infrastructure, about CPU, about um, uh, memory, uh, available memory, about mm, machine sizes, machine characteristics, firewalls, routers, whatever you have in the technical infrastructure is important part of the architecture. As developers, you know why you need it to debug runtime problems. Now, if you have a runtime problem, somebody writes an error report, it's no good idea to say, oh, it works on my machine. Um, you have to know about the deployment environments, about the infrastructure. That's part seven of ARC42, giving you details of the infrastructure. In our case of that open source system, it's fairly trivial. We have the user's computer where the system is run. The system is deployed from some kind of Maven repo, that's all standard Java stuff. It's not very interesting here, but usually deployment, the deployment view in ARC42 is one or two diagrams, again, amended by some tabular description of what these boxes uh, are really like, what the, what the arrows mean, what kind of network connections is available and so on. So that's deployment view. Now, part eight of ARC42, is really, really going down into details. I don't want to go into details of this open source system with you, but everything you need to know as a developer to maintain the system, to fix bugs, to um, add additional use cases or features to the system, all these details, the reasons why we choose the template methods, whatever pattern, <sighs> This is interesting for you as developers or a development team. For the future developers joining our team, they probably want to know why the heck did you do it that way? Ah, have a look at the concepts. We'll explain all the details. I don't want to explain the details of my open source system, but I want to pinpoint the cross-cutting concepts part eight of ARC42 that's the place to go. That's the place to look for detailed information. You might even include source code examples here. Um, as I said, I'm a really bad programmer. I included some source code I have written. You probably spot some optimization uh, potential. Yes, that's nice. Open a pull request in the repo. But I want to talk about documentation here. It's done that way. This is the truth. Uh, by the way, in the original documentation of that open source, the source code is included via an ASCII doc include. So it's not copy and paste. It's copy and paste on a PowerPoint. But in the real documentation, it's an include to the original repo. So it's current all the time. Good thing to have. In the concepts, you might give detailed information. In architecture, it's all about decisions. Architects and development teams take decisions all the time. Some of these decisions are more important than others. Some are very fundamental. You have seen decisions in the solution strategy at the beginning, but there are often more. In ARC42, there is section number nine, architecture decisions. In ARC42, we propose to use architecture decision records, a very, very well-known structure for decision explanation. I did use it on my PowerPoint slides. I recorded some decisions in the table. Um, these decisions from my open source are not important here. It's important to note there is a section dedicated to decisions that are not explained at any other location. So a decision, why did we structure the source code in a specific way? That's a decision from the building block view, from the building block structure. But there might be others you wanna explain, you wanna keep in the documentation and section nine 
is the location for decisions. And that's it. What I wanted to show you about the structure of ARC42 by the example. I suggest if you think architecture documentation is interesting, might be interesting for you and you know that your documentation could need some improvement, have a look in the ebook. Um, Bladar will be, uh, will be pasting the link into the meetup description. I will post the link in the YouTube description. Um, if you still have no chance to get the link, ask him personally, write an email to me. I'm most happy to, to give the link um, for the ebook. Have a look at the examples in the ebook. They are way better than the one I showed you here. You have probably, you, you will find many more details. Um, you find examples from various authors having different opinions on ARC42. Um, and yeah, uh, that's one place to start, but it's a lot of reading. If you are lazy like myself and you probably want to give an overview to a colleague, then head over to the free open source website arc42.org. Um, I copied a few of these statements from the overview. Um, it might be a place to start um, to get an impression what's contained in the various uh, sections. Um, as I said, arc42 itself is quite heavily documented. No, it's not heavily. Um, there is a lot of documentation available. I hope it's lightweight. Um, it's structured according to the template itself. So if you have any question, what the heck was that runtime view again? Head over docs.arc42.org. It's a free, again, open source website containing loads of tips. It's, I created that slide um, uh, last Monday. Um, it's 139 by now. This number is a real counter. So if you have additional tips and hints, open a pull request and um, we're probably surpassing 140 in the next few weeks. So there, this, this website actually has been made for teams using ARC42. So they can get some hints and tips how others have done it, how, uh, what kind of alternatives are available to explain an external interface, whatever. These are ordered by keywords, so you, you'll you find a way of finding the appropriate information. There is even a frequently asked question site. Um, again, that one has also more than 130 something questions. Um, the search engine could need some improvement. So if you want to participate in open source projects, we could need somebody that improves the search on the FAQ, but uh, yeah, you are free to use and copy all the content from, from these sites. That's what I wanted to tell you about the structure of ARC42. Now, in practice, you need to do it. Doing it requires some kind of tooling. Um, I don't want to advertise too many specific tools. I've brought one, which is Draw.io which is a free, freely available, it's not open source, but it's freely available on all platforms, Linux, um, Windows, Mac. Um, and it's, it's kind of Visio, but for free. And from my point of view, the usability is better. So if you want to draw small diagrams, it's not models, it's diagrams, it's images. Images can be useful, um, I like Draw.io, uh, it can export in all, all formats, it writes some XML format. It, it's a nice, nice handy tool to support architecture documents. Um, I personally like to write documentation in plain text. Um, so ASCII doc, I think ASCII doc is better than Markdown because ASCII doc really has some modularity. Um, concepts so you can write huge documents in ASCII doc. Markdown is not made for huge documents. So I prefer ASCII doc to Markdown. Um, I like wikis. So if you have 
the chance to document your architecture in Confluence. It's perfect. Um, it's multi-user. It's good for business people too. So the subject matter experts, uh, they don't like to write ASCII doc, but they like to contribute in wikis. So that's nice. Even Word is capable of um, creating architecture documents. I don't know um, if you have a love-hate relationship to Microsoft Word. I spent several years creating documentation with it, so um, it's, it's okay. My favorite, as I said, is ASCII doc. Why? At first, it has been created for huge documentation. And second, I can write it where I create my source code. Oh, you can write it where you create your source code. This is a screenshot of my favorite IDE, but it works in Atom, in Visual Studio Code, in Eclipse, and in many other development environments. Um, you can write ASCII doc, you can check the ASCII doc documentation in your Git or Subversion, whatever you're using, with the same tooling you use for your source code. So this is, at least for you tech guys, it's a very nice and elegant way of creating and maintaining documentation. Um, this is the link I promised. You don't need to write it down from here. Um, we still have the LeanPub book. The content is exactly the same as the very nicely printed um, packed book, but the packed book, a book we cannot give away for free. We can give away vouchers for the LeanPub, so take that, the content is the same. Yes, I just lost some money because we get uh, we earn money by selling pack books, but I prefer keeping it open source. That's it from my side. Thank you very much for staying uh, staying until now. Um, I had no chance to follow the chat. I'll have a look right now. Yeah, the sanity checker is 